we ourselves as Baker Hughes have a carbon commitment, net zero for 2050. We introduced it at the beginning of 2019. And by 2030, we're looking to reduce our own emissions by 50%. I'm glad to say that since 2012, we've reduced our own emissions by 31% already. So we know that there are ways in which we can do this. And collectively, that's really what we've got to do as an industry. Welcome back to another edition of COVID-19 from crisis to creation here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia falco Bicali, your host. And today we're going to talk about an industry that everybody seems to love to hate. And that is the energy industry, fossil energy industry. Why? Well, simply because of climate change and the damage it does on a natural level, on a human level, and also on an economic level. But one thing for sure, if you think about all the agreements that have been out there, have been done, signed, and dusted, for example, the Paris Agreement is now a little older than five years, uh, binding 196 countries really to keep global warming to about two degrees centigrade max, or better yet, 1.5, not much has happened since, as far as I can see from the latest statistics, we are moving towards three degrees Celsius in terms of global warming on average, if you compare it to pre-industrial levels. So what does that mean for the energy sector? We need to transform it, become a little bit more green and clean, if not a lot, in order to reach those targets and become really uh, CO2 neutral by 2050. There are two fundamental things in life. A, we do need our planet to live, and B, we also need energy to live. So how do you really reconcile this uh, issue, these two facts, and what does it mean for the energy sector? So I thought there are many, many questions I have in my head, and I invited Lorenzo Simonelli. He's the president and CEO of Baker Hughes. Baker Hughes, one of the biggest players when it comes to the oil and gas supply and service industry, and he agreed to join us here on the show. Lorenzo, so good. What an honor to have you here on Mentorate TV. Patricia, thank you very much. It's great to be with you and uh, looking forward to the discussion ahead. Well, let me first of all frame you a little bit to our viewers. First of all, um, Baker Hughes has been informed between a merger of GE Oil and Gas and Baker Hughes back in 2016 and 17. And this is when you became the CEO of the company. Now, this company is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Last I saw last week, market cap about 24 billion US dollars, turnover around 21 billion, and your share price as of late, as many actually energy stocks uh, and uh, in the industry itself, has had quite a good rally. So that really frames you. But what we are all interested in, what is the current status quo, Lorenzo, of the energy business right now? Well, look, I think your introduction was very apt. And uh, clearly, the energy landscape is unfolding quickly. And I think what we've seen during 2020 and also the impact of the pandemic is a bigger discussion around the energy transition. And as you look at investments within oil and gas and also what's happened from a demand perspective, the pandemic has obviously impacted us like others. But the discussion around how do we decarbonize, how do we reduce emissions has actually gained momentum during this 2020 period. And I think that's really the discussion at hand is how we're going to change the energy landscape and actually evolve as an oil and gas industry within the energy transition. And as you mentioned as well, it's clear that oil and gas has a role to play within providing energy. And there's solutions that we need to introduce to actually take the carbon emissions and reduce those. We ourselves as Baker Hughes have a carbon commitment, net zero for 2050. We introduced it at the beginning of 2019. And by 2030, we're looking to reduce our own emissions by 50%. I'm glad to say that since 2012, we've reduced our own emissions by 31% already. So we know that there are ways in which we can do this. And collectively, that's really what we've got to do as an industry. Yeah. And I think this is so important because the how is what is interesting. So you have a target, you have a mission, and you're starting to implement. And if I look at many other players in the sector, they seem to be really quite slow. To what extent is really technology and innovation something that uh, is part of Baker Hughes that drives that particular sector into the right direction? 
Well, Patricia, we actually call ourselves an energy technology company. And as you mentioned, we're the merger between Geoil and Gas as well as Baker Hughes. And we're looking to provide the technology that enables decarbonization and a lower carbon footprint. I look at efficiencies that we can already provide by remote operations, which decrease the footprint of people on platforms, the new upgrades of equipment and efficiency of the equipment that we're providing, new aero derivatives, new gas turbines. There's also the opportunity to measure, detect, and capture the emissions. And that's where we're really evolving as an energy technology company. And it's not only for utilities or oil and gas, but it's really across the spectrum of energies utilized by multiple industries. And we can actually work in cement, we can work in steel uh, to actually reduce the carbon footprint. Yeah, it seems to be kind of a binary game, uh, Lorenzo. Either you reduce emissions or you increase the efficiency of the energy that is available. Yes, and I think it's actually twofold. You're going to need both in parallel. So as you look at the opportunity to get to net zero, it's over time. And we've still got to manage the production and also the availability of energy. So the best way today is actually decrease the impact of oil and gas within the energy stream and continue the movement from coal to gas, which we think has a very bright future, especially as a transition fuel, until we get to the stage of more renewables, more hydrogen, the carbon capture and the sequestration, which are all technologies that need different policies, they need an infrastructure, and so that's going to take some time. So we've got to bridge that as we go forward. Yeah, and let me pick you up on hydrogen. By the way, I spoke to Andy Marsh, the CEO of Plug Power, and he said, say hi to Lorenzo when you have him, because I think Baker Hughes is also quite active in decarbonization through hydrogen. Yes, that's correct. And actually, we've had um, compressors that have been deployed in hydrogen since 1962, and we've got over 2,250 compressors. We know how to manage hydrogen. And we think that hydrogen has got a great opportunity as being a net zero fuel. Now with that, you do need an infrastructure, you need policies in place. And so where we're playing is we know the technology and we can combine it with CCUS. We can combine blue to green hydrogen by going off renewables. And that's the landscape that we're playing through. But I, I will say for as much as there's a discussion around hydrogen today, we really need the policies, we need the infrastructure, and that's going to take some time to develop. Uh, today, it's uh, a lot of discussion, but we need to do more of the pilot projects. Yeah, but I like what you're saying, because you see, uh, we need policies, we need infrastructure. So what is in my mind happening, Lorenzo? So on one hand, you have these international deals in order to really get to grips with climate change, be it from the UN, be it from the EU, or be it the, the Paris agreement in, agreement in general. But at the same time, there you have providers potentially of greener uh, energy sources, and they are lacking that support. Am I getting that right? Yes. If you look at uh, technology-wise today, so we've already tested one of our gas turbines with SNAM to be deployed on pipeline applications and a mixture of hydrogen and natural gas. Now, you need the policies and you need the further development of the demand for hydrogen. So, you know, we see the transportation sector as being uh, one of the first movers, especially with heavy duty trucks, also any point to point vehicles from a bus perspective. Then we see it in cement, uh, where we know that uh, cement is a big emitter of CO2 as well as steel manufacturing. Those are the key areas where hydrogen can be applied immediately. But again, you need to have the policies in place. And uh, we're already working on some pilot projects for hydrogen. And, you know, we've got a gas turbine that will run 100% on hydrogen. Yeah. And you also are very much into the other forms of greener fuel, be it um, thermal, be it wind as well. So I just wonder, you know, if I look at these different kind of alternative uh, energies, be it electric vehicles or battery, and then you have hydrogen, then you have wind power, you have solar energy. What do you actually think really is long term the solution to get to our targets of becoming zero emission by 2050, which in a way is almost around the corner. 
It is around the corner. And, uh, you know, you look at the number of countries now that have also committed to net zero. I think there's still a lot that's unknown on how they're going to get there. We believe that it is a stage progression. And it starts with, first of all, gas and gas being the replacement towards coal when you think of power generation. Then you continue to drive efficiencies in oil and also decrease the carbon footprint of oil. And there's ways to actually capture CO2 and also store CO2. And those technologies exist today. So that combination, plus the efficiencies through new equipment, new sensors, new detection, will then also enable the continued growth of renewable solar, which will happen. Then hydrogen starts to come in. And hydrogen is ampliful. It is very much seen in the world and it's very available. So I think the longer term solution is going to be hydrogen in certain applications. And again, starting with transport first and evolving. Uh, but it's really a mutually parallel path with these other elements taking place at the same time. So um, you need to be multifaceted. And that's why Baker Hughes is energy technology. Yeah, and, and this, is, this is fascinating because you're describing a step-by-step -step process how one can really, through, uh, through technology, approach that um, zero to emission target. But one thing I just noticed, Lorenzo, you didn't actually talk about battery, maybe on purpose, but maybe um, just because, because I'm very critical of electric vehicle, I, uh, vehicles in general, and I, I don't know anything or not much um, <laughs> about the sector apart from a consumer. But if I look at the entire, you know, know, um, uh, supply chain or the creation of an electric vehicle. I don't like the front end and I don't like the back end because in order to create the batteries, you need energy. And most of that energy is uh, A, a lot and B, not necessarily clean. And then the waste management of these lithium batteries, that is really what worries me for generations to come. So I don't really, I'm not sold on it being you know, long term. For me, it's an interim technology, whatever Elon Musk does and however much, you know, governments support him in what he's doing. Am I wrong? I, I think that you're going to see continued development in energy storage. And if you look at the intermittency of the electric grid, storage does play a role. And we're going to see new technology and advances that take place in storage. And when you think of electric vehicles, they'll have their niche as well. Uh, associated with uh, small movements and urban city movements uh, being utility electric vehicles. So I, I think you're seeing, and your points are well taken, there's got to be continued investment and also development of batteries and storage that uh, becomes also reusable, recyclable. And I think uh, we'll see that coming in the future years as well. Let me quickly interrupt the conversation to say thank you that you are here with me on the channel. If you do enjoy what I'm putting out, the in-depth kind of conversations, then why don't you subscribe and also hit the bell button so I can keep you informed with our newest releases. Thanks for that in advance. And let's get back to the conversation. Coming to the uh, efficiency, you know, I love AI. And I saw that Baker Hughes is actually quite a bit into, you know, data gathering, the analytics, just in order to make the processes more efficient. How much of a role will play actually AI in, in, in developing this industry? Very much. And um, if you think about uh, the energy evolution, Today, there is a lot of waste. And there's a lot of waste because you lose energy, which if you have the right data collected, you have the right artificial intelligence, you can optimize and become much more predictive of where energy can be captured and utilized more efficiently. And, you know, there's a common saying, you know, there's a probably about 30% waste when you look at uh, the aspect of the way energy is generated today. Data, artificial intelligence, the ability to drive digitization through our actual value chain is going to enable us to reduce that. So, Yeah, the, the, the spill, the uh, energy spill is, is in, incredible. And I just thought it was kind of funny because I, for me, data is the new oil. And it should kind of transform the oil industry, of course, as well. I thought that was, uh, that, uh, that was interesting. No, definitely. Um, you know, oil has got a role to play. If you think of all the products of oil, they're also recyclable. So you're going to see downstream 
a lot more recycling taking place of the plastics, of the actual products that are coming from oil as well. Yeah, without getting into politics, but you know, I, I mentioned the the uh, Paris Agreement earlier on, and also economic damage. I think the latest estimates that because of climate change and you know natural disasters, the economy uh, is costing the economy about a hundred billion US dollars every single year. And then the NASA came out, no other one than that, and they they said that by 2050, if we don't do anything, the accumulated damage in terms of money for the economy would be about three percent of global GDP or over uh, 8 trillion US dollars, which is, which is amazing. So something needs to be done. But I wonder, you mentioned the, the crisis right at the beginning, Lorenzo, and that it does impact the industry. One thing might be, I can think, okay, the cyclical impact on people becoming poorer simply because we are, we are facing an economic crisis. The other thing is the long-term investment process and, and how much funds will be flowing from individual governments as well, in order to become more and more um, carbon neutral? So um, again, we've been impacted as an industry this year because uh, final investment decisions have been uh, pushed out and also the demand decline has meant that uh, there's been a lot of capital discipline required by the industry. So you're going to have to balance what's going to happen in the short term versus the medium term and the long term. And we are going to have to see some investment return back into the industry so as to provide the supply that's going to be required. At the same time, governments need to, as they did with the growth of renewables in the past, implement the right policies and also the right subsidies to bring the cost point down of the new solutions. If you think of hydrogen, you think of carbon capture under sequestration, today the reality is it's a tough financial equation. And as it was when you go back in time for renewables and solar and wind, and that's what we are now looking at is how do we continue to have the right policies in place. There's also other themes that you mentioned, geothermal. Geothermal will continue to grow and where it's available will be continued to be used. Mm. And about 70% of your business is actually outside um, America. It is international. If you had to, you know, if you look at the dynamics, what countries are really pushing uh, and demanding your transformative services and technologies in order uh, to, to become, you know, a little bit greener, where's the most dynamic? Where's the most uh, really investment and putting the money where the mouth is happening right now? So you're seeing a lot of activity in Europe. And again, Europe being very conscious of the uh, Paris Agreement and also the role that they can play. So the European Union, Southeast Asia countries, um, you look at Korea, you look at Japan, uh, again, being very much on the forward leaning side of regulations and policies. But I'd also say, you know, when you go out to the Middle East, uh, countries that are uh, fueled by hydrocarbons and their economies are fueled, they're looking at ways they can be the most efficient producers because it's going to become a question of how much CO2 content do you have within what you're producing, because it's still going to be necessary. So we're working across the board with many operators on really being able to bring down their carbon footprint. And that's going to be the first step as the other energy mix evolves. And you and I will see, you know, oil and gas continue to be a large portion of the energy mix for the future decades until we get the infrastructure and the right policies in place. Yeah, and I think it's not too long ago that you actually signed a partnership with Saudi Aramco. Is that, is that something you're referring to? Yes, and if you look at some of the areas where we're working with them, non-metallics. Uh, non-metallics is actually a composite that is much less uh, CO2 intensive than metal pipes. And so they're looking at ways in which they can continue to actually move forward with reducing their own carbon intensity. So Aramco's there, Adnoc, others. I think, again, the lower cost basins understand that they need to also be the lowest emitters of carbon. Yeah. Okay. Well, in order to kind of sum up um, this, this first part of our discussion, Lorenzo, let me ask you, is the Paris Agreement, you know, cutting our CO2 footprint by 50% in nine years time by 2030, is that realistic? Are we really moving fast enough? Is there enough, you know, PPP, as to say, uh, in order to really realize this? Or is this going to be just postponed, 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 as we've seen so often uh, during the, the, the COP conventions? 
So it's a very good question, and I don't think uh, I can give you a solid answer because so much will depend on also the way in which companies as well as governments align and move forward. What I can say is that from a technology standpoint, uh, technology is there to help achieve the Paris Accord. And you look at um, carbon capture under sequestration. Today, there's 40 million tons. Now, if you go to reaching the Paris Agreement, you need above 2 billion tons. Now, that's possible. It's not that there isn't the possibility of doing that, but you need the financial framework, you need the economics to work, and you need the policies to be there. So I think uh, you know, we'll see how this evolves over the course of the next few years. What I will say is you know, the social backdrop and also the number of conversations have intensified in 2020. And we've got to be part of it and actually work together in partnership to enable the technology and also the economic equation. Yeah, absolutely. And and I like what you were saying there because you do have an environment, you know, I can imagine you, you, you uh, talking to a lot of heads of states and perhaps going to, to India, let's say, um, or, or China as well, but India, let's put it this way. I wonder to what extent, you know, becoming a green economy is top of their priority if they've got billions of mouths to feed ASAP, whatever the CO2 footprint. Do you see sometimes this kind of, yeah, but we have other priorities. People need to survive first before they can survive on a greener level. Or, or has that changed? I'd say it's changed because when you look at both China and India and you look at their uh, leaders, Xi Jinping has already made a commitment that China will be net zero by 2060. Um, Prime Minister Modi discusses very eloquently the transition towards gas and actually reducing the CO2 content. So, you know, they're the two most populous nations in the world, and you've got their leadership that's talking about the impact of carbon. Now, it has to be done in unity with the economic situation and the continued development. But I go back to, again, gas, the importance of gas. Today, you can displace kerosene, you can displace diesel, you can displace other fuel types that are much more carbon intensive by the development of gas. Coal will be displaced by gas, and that's already a much lower footprint of carbon. And I think you've seen gas develop in China a tremendous amount. It looks to continue its development. I think India as well has a big uh, investment on its gas as well. Okay. Well, I've learned just so much uh, just now also about those two countries that I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to see that. I, uh, let's, let's change a little bit dynamics, Lorenzo, and talk about you as, uh, as a leader, as the president and CEO of Baker Hughes. You know, it is, I think, um, after, um, it's not Halliburton, it is, who is your biggest co competitor? The name escapes so me. Schlumberger is the largest. Schlumberger, of course. Schlumberger, and then comes Baker Hughes, and then it's Halliburton, and then it comes, about, comes to market cap, I think. Thank you very much for that. Now, um, you know, you took... <laughs> your, your current position over after the merger. I mentioned that before. Before that, you were the CEO of GE Oil and Gas. Tell me about the transformation of Baker Hughes after the merger. Um, what were the main challenges you had? And that ends the first part of my conversation with Lorenzo Simonelli. He is the president and CEO of Baker Hughes. We discuss the energy sector, its transformation, and what the future may hold. And on a general note, if you do like the conversations I have here on Mentory TV with my guests, why don't you join us? Become part of the community. Subscribe to the channel for free. Hit the bell button, and I will always keep you informed about the latest videos out there. And I hope you're going to join us also for the second part with Lorenzo very soon.